This lecture is going to deal with the anatomy of your skeletal system. In particular, the bones which make up your skeletal system. We'll be talking about the structure of those bones and the structure of the bone tissue that makes up those bones and how it all comes together to produce the skeletal system that supports your body. First thing that I want to talk about is the difference between bone tissue and your bones. Bone is a term that can refer to both of these, but in one sense, we're talking about an actual tissue. And you will remember from your tissue lecture that tissues are aggregates of cells, which are the same type of cell that come together and produce a related function. So bone tissue is contained within your bones, but the bones of your skeleton can actually be thought of as organs of your skeletal system. Your skeletal system is made up of many individual bones, and not just bones either. It's got cartilages and other types of connective tissues, but what we would consider the organs of your skeletal system are your individual bones, your humerus, your ribs, your clavicle, your sternum, those types of things. And the bones are made up of bone tissue which is also sometimes referred to as osseous tissue, is a type of connective tissue, and it is made up of hardened minerals, mostly calcium phosphates, and it also contains other organic molecules. We'll be talking about that later. But this particular type of tissue helps to make up bones, but bones as organs have other types of tissue and other structures as well. There's nerves that innervate bone tissue. There are blood vessels that run into bone tissue. So bones, and you'll be hearing both of these terms over the course of this lecture, bones are the organs of your skeletal system, whereas bone tissue is a typical type of tissue that makes up your bones. So I just wanted to get that straight before we go any further because we'll be sort of flipping back and forth between both of these terms. So if we look at the bones of your skeleton, we can classify the different bones that make up your skeleton by their shape, loosely classified by their shape. And those four classifications are long bones, short bones, flat bones, and irregular bones. And irregular bones are sort of kind of like a catch-all category that for bones that don't fit in any of the other three, but you'll see why that makes up a useful category in a minute. Long bones are exactly that. They are bones that have a long longitudinal axis and are longer in one dimension than in the other. So basically what that means is they are longer than they are wide. Short bones are bones that are not necessarily exactly cube-like, but they have their two axes are more or less the same length. Good examples of long bones include the long bones in your limbs, the humerus, radius, and ulna in your arms, your femur in your leg, your tibia and fibula in your legs. These are good examples of long bones. Examples of where you might find short bones in your body include things like your carpal bones, your wrist bones. These are examples of bones that are basically the same length as they are wide. So those are some examples of both long and short bones. Flat bones, again, pretty self-explanatory in terms of the definition. Bones that are broad and flat uh, cover a wide surface area, but aren't very tall. Examples of flat bones include your sternum, your scapulae in your back, your pelvic bones, the bones of your cranium and your skull. These are all examples of flat bones, even though they may be curved and not exactly flat like you might think of a piece of paper. And then finally, we have the irregular bones. And the irregular bones, again, are bones that don't have necessarily a regular shape and can't really be put into one of the other categories. So things like your vertebrae that have like a disc and then bony projections coming off of that disc, or a lot of your facial bones are also bones that are irregular. So these are the four basic categories of bones. Some people recognize a fifth group called sesamoid or round bones. These are bones that are often found within tendons or other connective tissues. Uh, things like your kneecaps, good examples of round bones. But 
all the bones in your body can typically be classified into one of these four groups, or five, depending on if you want to classify those sesamoid bones uh, as uh, a group of bones. So now we're going to look at the structure of bones. We're going to use long bones as our model for bone structure because you can see a lot of the different structures associated with bones and we can then extrapolate the structures to the other types of bones but long bones because of their regularity make a good place to start. So if we look at a long bone again you don't need special anatomical training to be able to tell what the basic shape of a long bone is. It's got a long thin shaft and then two sort of widened ends on either end of that shaft. The terms for these two structures are the diaphysis, that is the term that refers to the shaft of a long bone, and then the ends of bones are the epiphyses. And considering that these long bones are usually found on limbs, we will often refer to the proximal epiphysis, which is the end of the bone that typically is closer to the core of the body, and the distal epiphysis, which is the end of the bone that's further out, or further out on the limb, closer to the end of the limb. Bone or osseous tissue makes up the bulk of your long bones, and the outside of the bones are coated typically with another type of connective tissue. The epiphyses are typically the articulation points for these bones and are usually covered with hyaline cartilage. In this case, sometimes we refer to it as articular cartilage because it helps to smooth the articular surfaces where the two bones come together and reduce friction. The rest of the bone is typically covered with a structure called the periosteum. The periosteum is a very tough outer connective tissue coating of the bone. It helps to protect the bone and it also helps to serve to produce attachment points. The periosteum is, as you can see in this diagram, connected to the underlying bone by a series of fibers called Sharpies fibers and these help to anchor the periosteum to the surface of the bone. The periosteum will often serve as anchor points for things like tendons and ligaments that have to attach to the bone to either attach other bones or muscles to the bone. The periosteum is composed of two distinct layers. The layer that I've just been referring to is the outer fibrous layer. And this is the layer that is composed of this dense, irregular connective tissue. It's very tough, it's protective, and it will serve as attachment points for tendons and ligaments. The inner layer is often referred to as the osteogenic layer. And one of the other instructors will discuss this layer a little bit more in the bone development and bone growth lecture. But for now, we're sort of laying the groundwork for that. The osteogenic layer consists of various types of bone cells or osteocytes. In this case, you've got two different types of cells, the osteoblasts, which tend to lay down new bone matrix, and the osteoclasts, which tend to reabsorb bone matrix. And these two types of bones, as you will see when you listen to that other lecture are very important for bone growth and bone remodeling. So the image on the left has a cutout of the upper portion of the bone. You can see the outer part of the bone down below and you'll see a longitudinal cut through the center of the bone up above. And one of the things that you'll notice is that the bone is not solid. It is not just one dense piece of tissue with no spaces in it. There are a lot of spaces. There are small spaces, as you can see in this upper part in the epiphysis, and there is a large cavity that runs down the center of the diaphysis. That cavity is called the medullary cavity, sometimes referred to as the marrow cavity, and this is where the bone marrow is located in a lot of your bones. In fact, Bone marrow tends to fill up all of these spaces, not just the medullary cavity. You have a lot in the medullary cavity, but you have a lot in these other hollow spaces within the other areas of the bone. 
You can also see, if we look at this cutout section of the bone, that there are areas where the bone tissue is more dense, and there are areas where the bone tissue is more sort of spongy with more of these sort of hollow spaces in and sort of winding their way through the bone. The medullary cavity is lined with a similar membrane to the periosteum and that membrane on the inside of the medullary cavity is called the end osteum. Peri means around, so the periosteum surrounds the outside of the bone. End osteum, end, means inside or within, so the end osteum lines the inside of that medullary cavity. And is very similar to the periosteum. There is a layer in the end osteum that contains osteoclasts and osteoblasts because, again, they, those cells are necessary for bone remodeling. So those two types of bone are referred to as compact bone. That is the type of bone that is more dense with less spaces in it. And spongy bone, sometimes referred to as cancellous bone. And spongy bone is the bone that, well, looks spongy. It has a lot of these spaces in it and these sort of ridges of bone running through it. Most of the time, these two types of bone are distributed in a pretty regular fashion. What you will have is the outside of the bones has most of the compact bone, and then the inner areas, both the inner lining of the medullary cavity and the bulk of the epiphyses, will be composed of spongy bone. In the case of other types of bones, for instance, flat bones, and here we're looking at one of the flat bones in your cranium, there may not be a medullary cavity. This has to do with how the bones are formed, and again, that will be the subject of a different lecture. But what you're seeing here are two areas of compact bone, and these, once again, are going to be the outer parts of the bone are made up of this compact bone and then sort of sandwiched in between those two layers is your spongy bone and these ridges that you're seeing these ridges of bone that sort of run through the spongy bone are called trabeculae and then the spaces in between those ridges in between the trabeculae are called diplo and once again in the case of flat bones this would be where the marrow would be located one of the functions of marrow is in producing blood, and your red marrow in particular is what produces red blood cells, platelets, and white blood cells. And in the case of your flat bones, this is where the marrow is going to be located. This is where the red marrow will be found, within the diplo or the spaces of your spongy bone. Marrow is often referred to as hemopoietic tissue. In particular, red marrow. Hemopoietic means blood forming. Red marrow is typically found in the diplo or the spaces of your spongy bone. And in the case of infants and children, it's also found in the marrow cavities or the medullary cavities of long bones. As you age, those medullary cavities change, and the marrow changes from red marrow, which is, again, involved in blood cell formation, to yellow marrow. Yellow marrow is basically a fat storage. So as you age, the blood cell formation function is retained within the flat bones, but the diaphyses of the long bones basically become a fat storage. So here, once again, we're looking at a long bone and we can see the shaft or the diaphysis of the long bone and we can see the layer of compact bone that makes up the outer edge of it. We can see the periosteum which covers the outside of that bone and then as we get towards the inside we can see the spongy bone that's lining the medullary cavity. So once again I want to focus on the compact bone. It's made up of these repeated structures, you can see that it looks sort of like cylinders, and you can see in cross-section the, the ends of the cylinders here. And these cylinders are called osteons. 
And again, they're sort of like the functional unit of the compact bone. Compact bone is typically made up of repeated osteons that are sort of cemented together to form this very dense compact bone. If we look at an individual osteon, we can see that it also has a very regular structure. And here you can see they've taken a little bit of a chunk out of one of the osteons and magnified it. If we look at an osteon, we can see that there's a long central canal that runs the length of the osteon. And through this canal, you will typically find running an artery, a vein, and a nerve fiber. They will run the length of the central canal, and you will often have capillaries and other uh, tributaries of these major vessels that sort of branch out to feed the cells within the bone. Surrounding this central canal, you will see layers of bone matrix. And the bone matrix is the calcified tissue that makes up the compact bone. And it's roughly laid down in layers. So you can see, if we look at this structure over here to the right, you can see one layer. And then outside of that, you can see another layer. And then outside of that, you can see another layer. And they're laid down not unlike tree rings. So if you look at the cross section, you can see these rings that show you the different uh, layers uh, of the matrix. In between these layers of matrix, you will find bone cells or osteocytes. And they're embedded in very small spaces in between the layers of matrix. Those layers of matrix are called lamellae. So you have these concentric lamellae or concentric rings of lamellae that run around that central canal. And then in between those lamellae, you have these spaces. And the spaces are called lacunae. And you should hopefully recall that term from your tissue lectures because the lacunae are the spaces within cartilage, the spaces within bone, and within those lacunae are where you find the cells. And in the case of bone, you have osteocytes. And what we see is these lacunae are connected to one another by very, very, very small passages, and those passages are called canaliculi, and what you see is the osteocytes have the cellular projections that run through the canaliculi and connect the osteocytes in adjacent spaces. So you have this osteocyte connected to this one, which is connected to this one, and what you have is this network of connections between osteocytes from the inner rings out to the outer rings. And the inner osteocytes are connected to the arteries and as a result are fed directly by the arteries. And then as you get to the cells that are further and further away from the arteries, they are fed indirectly by the cells that are closer to the arteries. So you have this network of cells that are living and this makes bone a very dynamic tissue. It has a very direct nourishment supply, it gets oxygen, and as a result, bone can remodel itself, it can heal when it's fractured, uh, and it's a very dynamic tissue for that reason. You can also see that there are blood vessels that run horizontally, essentially, which connect vessels in the inner canals to the vessels that are running into the bone from the outside. So you have the major artery that's going to run into the bone that's running under the periosteum, and then that will run via these transverse or perforating canals, sometimes referred to as Folkman's canals, and connect up with the <coughs> arteries and veins running through the central canals of the inner osteum. Also associated with these lamellae are collagen fibers. And collagen fibers are one of the three different types of fibers that are associated with connective tissues. And the collagen fibers help to provide flexibility, and we'll talk more about this in a minute. But what you can see here is that the direction of the collagen fibers are sort of opposite. 
one another. They run sort of tangentially uh, in one direction, and then in the next lamella out, they'll run not quite 90 degrees, but diagonally in the opposite direction, and then in the next lamella out, they'll run in the opposite direction again. And what you'll get is this support of the hard matrix by these collagenous fibers. So, we've been talking about spongy and compact bone, and they basically have the same composition. Bone tissue, or osseous tissue, has two parts. What we call the osteoid, which is the organic part, and the hydroxyapatites, which are the inorganic part. The osteoid is composed of things like glycoproteins, collagenous fibers that we were just talking about, and the osteoid provides flexibility and strength. Uh, it helps to resist flexing, and it gives bone the ability to deal with stresses without fracturing, it's sort of like how rebar reinforces concrete. The hydroxyapatites are the inorganic part, and it's mostly mineral salts, mostly calcium phosphates, but there's other minerals in there, fluoride, sulfate, potassium, magnesium. The hydroxyapatites account for the hardness of bone, and when you combine the osteoid with its flexibility and tensile strength and the hardness of the hydroxyapatites, you get a very strong structure. You get a structure that is, for compressional forces, about half as strong as steel, and for resisting tension, about as strong as steel. So this becomes a very, very, very functional structure. So let's look at the skeletal system as a whole. You've got about 206 bones in the human body. Give or take, the actual number is going to vary. Occasionally you have extra bones that form within the sutures of the skull called sutural bones or wormian bones. Uh, but these are not necessarily regularly found in everybody. But occasionally those sutures get pretty wild and you can get extra bones forming in there. Additionally, you may have extra small round sesamoid bones. We mentioned those earlier. And those sometimes develop within tendons as a result of friction. So the actual number may vary. But in terms of the named bones, you've got about 206 bones. And we break up the skeletal system into two basic parts. The axial skeleton and the appendicular skeleton. The axial skeleton is composed of the skull, the vertebral column, including the coccyx and sacrum, the ribs, and the sternum. So basically right down the axis of the body. And then the appendicular skeleton is composed of the appendages, so the upper and lower appendages, and the girdles. The girdles are the bones which attach the appendages to the axial skeleton. So you've got the pectoral girdle, the scapula and clavicle, which attach the upper limbs to the axial skeleton. And then you have the pelvic girdle, which is composed of the pelvic bones, which attach the lower limbs to the axial skeleton. So here you can see a closer up view of the axial skeleton, showing you the skull, including the mandible and the hyoid bone, and the vertebral column, including the sternum and the coccyx, and the ribs and the sternum, which make up the axial skeleton, and then the appendicular skeleton composed of the pectoral girdle, including the clavicle and the scapula, the upper limb bones, the humerus, the radius, the ulna, the carpals, metacarpals, and phalanges, the pelvic girdle made up of the coxal bones, and the lower limbs, including the femur, the patella, the tibia, the fibula, the tarsals, metatarsals, and phalanges. You have other types of tissues associated with the skeleton, not just osseous tissue. You have cartilages, often referred to as the skeletal cartilages. And as you learned in the tissues lecture, there are three basic types of cartilages. The most abundant, of course, is hyaline cartilage. It's found at the ends of those long bones. It's uh, also a precursor to a lot of different types of bones. It's found in the respiratory system and the nose, the costal cartilages, as well as your articular cartilages. The elastic cartilage is not as much associated with the bones. It's found in your external ear and your epiglottis. 
and the fibrocartilage, which is a precursor to flat bone development and is found in areas like your pubic symphysis and your intervertebral discs. The last thing we want to talk about are the markings on bones, and these will become very important when we start doing the bone labs. Bones are protective, they serve as attachment points, and as such you have connections to them. There are various types of projections referred to as things like processes and heads and spines and trochanters and things like that, which are there for attachment or articulation. There are holes or depressions in bones. These are things like foramina and canals and sinuses and grooves. Uh, and these often form passageways for things like blood vessels, nerves, or other structures to run through. So keep these in mind when you are doing the bone labs because they're going to become very important.